And they run out of competition for that. <laughs> and you know, when you're, when you're, some of these boxes, the one that was a tea chest, full of the brim, and you start to go through it. And you just don't know what you're going to come across. You can come across gold dust or dumb. <laughs> it, it could be, and, it goes, and to see some of these things coming up, you know, they, the likes of that, to find that now, I think that's incredible to find that. <laughs> 1914, 110 years ago. Um, Irish Beekeepers Federation, 1905 in Cremessen. Uh, yeah, two more there, 1906. And he was, he was he, I remember out at my gate, there was about 30 hives of bees out there. Is that the last one? Yeah. Yes, love you to say thank God. <laughs> <laughs> but I have another spike there. Did you get the. Did you get the. He used that. I remember as, as a kid, to kick a football out, out, out the little hag, haggard out the back. There was about 20 hives there. And when you kick the football over the place, then you, you hear this. <laughs> when you heard that. <laughs> You got going and creature going because the bees were beginning to surround you. He was able to. He was able. You, everyone, anyone know you have two bees here? Yeah. Well, you know, you know what a skep is. Yeah. This would be a, the old fashioned one. Old fashioned one. And I have photographed him and he up the ladder and Uncle Aidan down below <laughs> catching them. Now, can you imagine the fellow down below? I don't know what they're looking at. My grandfather never, he could get stung, and he never, he never got. He, I remember one of his bees, one, he stung, he stung me here in the eye. I had a, a little bicycle, and it was flying up and down the road, and I got stung just here over my eyelid. That eye closed completely, and this one got half closed. And so I was riding the bike up and down, and he, grandfather was a fierce contrary man. Like, he was a great man in lots of ways. And a bad family man in other ways, because he was just into too much of this stuff. And he said, every time you see a young fella, give me a kick in the arse, he says, choose their language. He said, he either coming from doing harm or he's going to do harm. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> but, and that was the way he taught. Um, I used to go, walk down, down to the, our road, down to, down to a, a side. It'd be about a mile and a half down to Harlem's. And he'd be walking along with the dog, and make my legs go, and he just trying to keep up with him. It was mine and a half, and I only knew that. But, um, but like, I'm not telling you half a story, because he's, he's a huge story. Um, but, well, all them, every day I do out there, it's just a story in every one of them. Every one of them. Yeah. The story, the, the story in R.J. Murray is phenomenal. If, if, if I, I'm not able to write it, if I could get someone to give me a hand to write it, because I have, I have the knowledge here and here. Like, Conrad Murray came out of that house. He was second, second eldest son. K.P. Murray in Sligo. Uh, Frank Murray in Albert Steel Products on Shrim Road. Yeah. Like, take, take them. And, and when the World of Educators, um, and I got the report to say when, when Conor McMurray was being accepted into, he went to Terranure College. Uncle Frank went to Ross Cray. Ed Murray went down to the Agriculture College down in, in um, halfway between Lanesborough and Galway, what do you call that one down there? Mount Benio. And uh, so they were well educated. My mother went to, to um, Mercy Convent and she was a boarder because I got postcards that she sent up. And she was boarder and she was only seven miles away from that. That's what that happened. Um, so they all, they all were well educated. Which is always money in the family, Richard. Right <laughs> well, that's all about money. You see why he is the grandson of him, you see. <laughs> um, but, um, <clears throat> and like, I, I, I feel myself privileged to be, be, be part of that family and to know the family and my mother. Like, my mother was, was the eldest family. And they, women normally would, and no disrespect to women, but they, they were homemakers and they were mothers and they were looking after the children. Uh, there was an evidence in that family. But my mother, and she was the first, and she was the man of the family, if you, know, if you can understand what I'm saying. She did drove the model, he turned drugs, she went around collecting money after the meals, she done all that. 
I think she was 19, she was, she was born in 1904, and she was married in 1937. I came nine months and a bit after. Um, so, <laughs> but, um, but for years afterwards, oh, they always talk, heard, talked about Maud Murray. <coughs> she was coming in to collect the money for, for after, the, after the trash. And it's an interesting story, and I, I, I'll probably finish on this now. How did my mother and father met? And I go back down to, down to, um, Trumbarrow. Trumbarrow. And, uh, the, what do you call the mill down there, um, near near Connolly's. There was a trash in 1929, there was a, a trash, in a two day trashing in it. And Cormac Murray and one other Murray brought the mill down and were trashing in, in Farley, Nicholas Farley's. And those years when they're doing the trashing, all the families around would come in to give a hand. There could be 20 people there. And the first day trashing was fine. The second day trashing, the Murray's weren't there. My father used to say, the Murray's always in a hurry, but never in time. That was, that was the saying he would say about them. And, but he was cute enough. He, 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 um, he worked in Dinny Lee's garage. In, anybody here in Dinny Lee's garage in Kells? No? Anyway, he... Um, and he, was, he worked with them, and then he went, he was, went down to Charleville to work, uh, driving a, a taxi. <coughs> but he came back then for the trashing. And when, he, when uh, Uncle Aidan, and, or Uncle Frank, and uh, Cormac arrived, the trash bin was working. And they couldn't figure out how he got to go. But he had been watching what they'd done the bit, day before, and he was trashed away when he came. So he reported back to their father, and in due course, uh, my grandfather offered him a job. The pound of meat all found. And that's how he, he eventually met the other. Now, my mother was 34 when she got married. And like, no one ever, would ever have thought that she would have a man in her mind at all, but <laughs> love, love is blind. <laughs> but it's only really just an incident happened. They finished up, I won't say where it was, but doing the contract, doing the trash, and, and some people would actually bring their power in there as mm. well, you know, setting up the bed. But it determined the end of the year when you had a good year out with the car and everything. You paid your bills and the trashing was the final thing. And someone said to the farmer, had you good trashing, you know? Oh, yes, he said. And then, which out? Yes, he said, I had. I had the chaff. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone was paid. Oh, you had the breakages and everything. And the car yeah. was paid. But anyway, that's just my contribution to showing you a few of the little bits of pieces I have. And, uh, and thank you very much. Can we ask a question? Yeah. Can we ask a question? Yeah. The woman, the woman who won, the woman who won the uh, darning competition. Did she bring it up along socks with ready-made holes in them? <laughs> <laughs> I never talk about that. <laughs> um, just on that, um, it was Norman's mother that won. There, the Murrays came second. Just <laughs> now, if anyone knows Norman Long, you know that's a lie. And <laughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen, give him a round of applause. Um, we won't say what age he is, but I just I hope to God that if I might get anywhere close, I have the energy and the spirit and just the enthusiasm that Richard has. He's, he's, he's incredible and every night we get this at Mini Me, we have great fun and he always does something and I tell you, it's, it's great, a great treasure to, to have. And we are recording it tonight and we have it. We have it um, Last thing I'm going to show you. <laughs> this is the Cork International Exhibition 1902, um, delivered by the Bosco something in three minutes. Now, you look in here, and it's a metal negative. Now, James Carney you now wrote all about it, he has copied this from me. And my grandfather was in, in the middle of that. So that's 1902, believe it or not. And his driver's license of 1922. <laughs> I have a dog license, I have every kind of license. <laughs> 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 
say thanks again. I know we're going out over our time a little. Normally we wouldn't be. Um, oh, by the way, yeah. Don't hear. Don't go on. Let's finish up and then we we'll let you back and we we'll let people go if they want to go with it. Is that all right? Just we're back and um, we're back here again on the 22nd of February um, with in um, St Stephen's Old Kakarn. Uh, we were out there with Christopher Lynch um, during Heritage Week. Fantastic talk, and we decided that we'd bring it back to people who missed it that night. His preparation, uh, his professionalism, he put together a fantastic uh, research, fantastic talk, and really well worth looking forward uh, uh, um, to hearing it again. So um, if you're around, you're very, very welcome, and hopefully um, we'll, we'll see you on, on that night. Otherwise, I'll let you back to two guys. If you really want to go home, or you have to go home, you can. If not, the lads will entertain you for a few more minutes. Anyway. Now I'm over to you. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.